Hello everybody, Kelly Rice here, but I write under my pen name, K.M. Rice, and welcome to my author vlog. Now given that it's the month of February, I thought this would be a good opportunity to um, utilize the presence of Valentine's Day and discuss the writing of sex scenes. You'll notice I didn't say how to write sex scenes because I don't believe in claiming that I am an authority on how to do anything. All I can offer is my heartfelt advice and experience. Now, a lot of people are actually too embarrassed or shy to ask about writing this type of scene. So here is my guidance. <laughs> like any scene, the first thing you're gonna want to do is assess what is the role that this scene plays in your story or in your book or in your, well, I suppose not a script, but what, what role is it? Are you using it to reveal something about the characters or are you using it to keep the plot going? Um, it's important that you figure that it could be both, but it's important that you kind of feel that out to begin with because that will inform your next steps. Tone in these scenes is very important. Um, again, here's my disclaimer. I am not in the romance category or the erotica category. I write um, general fiction with um, usually love stories as part of my fiction. So there is romance in there, but it's always secondary. Um, romance as a genre has kind of its own standards. So um, if you're writing in that genre, I'm not going to be an expert, so as always though, take what you will, leave the rest. Um, so tone. Tone is very important, um, and I'd say this is the number one thing that you need to think about when you're writing a scene of this nature. Is the encounter the, the, the final culmination between two, two lovers who have been fighting to be together and it's impassioned and it's romantic and it's sexy? or is it a one night stand and it's just pure physicality, there's no emotion attached? Or is it something that is more emotional and less physical, even though there's a physical side, that's not really the focus? Um, or is it something else? So I suggest sometimes you kind of have to write the scene first and keep the story going, especially if you're like me and you don't plot ahead of time, to determine where kind of on the spectrum your scene lies and what, what it means for your characters and for the story. But once you sort of establish that tone, and this is where it gets tricky, your tone is going to, your tone is going to inform the language that you use to describe the scene, and the language that you use is going to inform the tone. I paused because that was confusing to me too. <laughs> Let me give you an example um, in what I mean by language. So I have read, both in writing workshops and in fiction, published fiction, um, and through doing it myself because I've written several scenes of this nature, um, not trying to spoil anything, but if you've read Ophelia, you have an idea of what I'm talking about. And I have found my own balance between describing things that, be, between describing things as a purely physical act versus a purely spiritual or emotional act and keeping the language in such a way that it's not like reading a biology textbook, but it's also not pornographic. Um, I know that that sounds funny and it seems like it's something that should be really easy, but <laughs> For anyone who's ever written a sex scene before, you'll know what I'm talking about, where it takes several drafts. This is something that almost always will take several drafts because you, um, you have to be able to distance yourself from it to really look at the language that you're using. And I'm, I'm stressing that because I think that in these scenes it is more so, um, the language is, is more important than other types of scenes. And again, that's because it informs the tone, but also because it is such an intimate act that 
it's easy to convey the wrong message. Um, I've workshopped other people's pieces before and they thought that they'd written, you know, like something romantic. They were curt in the way they described it, but because of the words that they used, it didn't come off as a love scene. It came off more as an assault. Um, and that's that's why I say you have to be careful about the language that you use. Plus, it, it is such a, a loaded moment of the human experience that you do want to be careful with your word choice and you want to be um, precise with how you are conveying this to your audience. Um, not just because you don't want people to think that you're writing um, a negative scene when it's supposed to be a positive one, but because it will color their view of the characters moving forward. Now, drinking my hot water instead of tea. We can't really talk about sex scenes without talking about sex. What is sex? Well, you could say it's the act of procreation, sure. But um, like I was outlining earlier, it can fall into a multitude of different categories. It's an activity people engage in for a multitude of reasons. Um, some Sometimes it is just the physical. Sometimes it is because uh, it's a form of stress relief. Other times it's a bonding experience. Other times it is just, um, I don't want to know your name. I don't need to know anything about you. Um, so there's there's a whole wide well, spectrum. Uh, and of course, there's all kinds of kinky things that go on too. And I think that sex is hard for people to talk about and hard to talk about writing sex scenes because not only is it somewhat taboo in our society and in our culture, but um, in the sexual world, things that are off limits in our daily lives are hot. And that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, for example, telling someone that they're naughty, you know, like in your daily life, you don't want your boss to say you did a bad job, like that's terrifying, but in the bedroom, that might be a turn on. So it's a very interesting psychology and it's a psychology that we aren't necessarily educated about. And that, I think, personally, I think that's kind of a, a shortcoming of of our education. I think that we need to focus more on emotional intelligence and interpersonal um, relationships. And it all just ties back into it being taboo and normalizing things. Um, I think that as long as it's consensual, uh, it's healthy. I don't want to say and nobody's getting hurt because some people like that and they want it, but they want it because they trust the other person so much that they know that they're not actually going to hurt them. See what I mean by it getting complicated? But that's exactly why I'm saying you have to be careful. Let's look at Fifty Shades of Grey. So Fifty Shades of Grey was about um, a relationship where one person was a dominant and one person was a submissive. I haven't read it and I haven't seen the movies, so I'm by far not an authority on this. But I, uh, I read a lot about it and there was concern that this relationship that, um, you know, was defined within these parameters of what was going on in the bedroom and that extending into daily life, there was concern that there are people who that was their example of what um, what sex should be, and that if that what that they didn't want that, then they don't have to have that. Um, it played into a lot of concerns of going back to my previous vlog episode of feminism and power. Ooh, really out of focus there. Don't know how that happened. The word feminism threw everything in a spiral. Whew, it always does. But in terms of the power play in that relationship, because uh, in that one the man had the power and control, and that was his and her turn on, I guess. And um, what that meant, you know, he was controlling multiple aspects of her life, what car she could drive, where she could go, what she could do. Um, that's kind of an extreme version of that type of relationship. And there was concern that, you know, it wasn't necessarily displaying it in the healthiest light, um, rather than showing like, this is, this is just one facet of this broad thing. Um, but I don't want to digress too much talking about 
stuff I haven't read or seen because that's foolish. But um, I bring it up because I'm, I'm using my hands, but I'm keeping them below the camera so that it doesn't go out of focus. Um, but I bring them up because it goes back to my caution about being precise with your language and precise with the, the point of the scene. Um, so let's talk about actual words in language. You have a wide variety. Um, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say on YouTube and <laughs> keeping this, um, keeping this suitable for advertisers. So I'm going to hint at some words here. Um, there are anatomically correct words. You know, the one that starts with a P, the one that starts with a V. And if you want to, you can use those words. However, you run the risk of sounding like um, it's a biology textbook. And that pulls the reader out right away. As soon as it becomes um, like watching the Discovery Channel, at least for me, that won't do it for me. I know I'm not like going in a smooth order here, but to jump away from words for a second, that is the point of every sex scene. Like you, when it's a love scene, I should say, you want the reader to be titillated. And we don't like to acknowledge that. And it makes us feel weird and uncomfortable, but we are animals and we're reading about other animals of our species. And you want, if, you, if you've done it right, if, if it's been successful, you want the reader to get a little, <clears throat> does anyone see me reading this? And you want them to get a little titillated because it, it, it evokes that reaction. Um, it's a fair, I think it's our second strongest instinct. The first strongest instinct is for food. Um, our sex drive is our second strongest. And it's very important to tap into those senses when you're writing because that will you know what I'm talking about as readers, that will hook you in and make it feel so much more real and authentic to you and help you invest um, in a way that just kind of skipping over it won't really. Now, back to the words used. So, you can use the anatomically correct words, and as I said, that runs the risk of sort of alienating the audience. I have read other scenes that are meant to be um, very climactic, very climactic, and um, the culmination of, of a love story, these two people who were at odds, at odds, at odds, and finally came together. It's, it's passionate, but it's also romantic. And yet the language used is the C word for a man and the P word for a woman and the T word for these. Um, some people don't take offense to that T word. Again, I'm sorry. I sound like a kindergartner because I don't know what I'm allowed to say here and I don't want to be kicked off YouTube. But um, yeah, you know, as a woman, I'm reading this and I'm like, wow, it just went there. You know, it just, it's like all of a sudden I'm in a men's locker room and we're using this coarse language that's making me look at the scene coarsely. It's making, that's also going to make me personally disengaged because suddenly I'm like, I don't know how into this I am because the language isn't necessarily respectful. And if the language isn't respectful, at least me, and I can be hypersensitive about this stuff, I'm going to look at it and go, I hope everything that's happening is respectful to the two people involved, even though they're fictional. But that's just, you know, our words, the words that we use in all of our writing influence the tone and influence the, the subconscious reading between the lines, the subtext, that's what I'm looking for. It influences the subtext of every scene. And if you're using language that is considered crude or harsh, you do run the risk of of, and I'm not trying to be like a prude button up my sweater, but you do run the risk of suggesting to some people that there is disrespect going on. Now, if that's what you want, then go for it. But I'm just laying that out there so that you could be aware that the language that you use matters. Now, conversely, using all airy fairy flowery language will alienate people too. I've read other scenes, other sex scenes where I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I'm reading, I'm reading. Oh, 
okay, it's over. Like, I think so, so, something happened, you know, someone, the big O. And then I'm like, oh, it, it, it wasn't. Oh, oh, okay, it keeps going. I'm not sure. Oh, are they, how are they? What are they doing? Hmm, oh, okay. Well, I just got very confused and I'm gonna keep going with the story. <laughs> that kind of thing, which you also don't want. So, <sighs> One thing that can work, but again, it detaches you from the physical nature of the act, is using purely emotional language. You can describe sex in that way, and I've described sex in that way. Um, but doing that, you have to be aware that, like I said, the reader is not going to have that titillated effect. Um, for example, I don't think Darkling has ever been referred to as like a sexy or titillating book. There's a love story in it. There's a scene where um, it's inferred that two characters get married and they, what is that, um, consecrate? They consecrate their marriage. But because it's young adult and sex is a bit of a no-no in young adult, I think the only line I used is, we lie down we come together and we lie down. Something like that. And the younger readers, if that goes over their head, that's fine. Um, for the older readers, they, they'll kind of get it and that's okay. But that um, was a description between two characters who, how can I say this without spoiling it? Between two characters who you're not supposed to invest heavily in their relationship. So I felt fine doing that. And plus it was important for it being young adult. Um, but. Also, yeah, like I was saying, if you're writing about it just in emotional terms, it, it can be hard to really bring someone into the scene. Now, for my, my personal style, what I like to do is use words that aren't crude, but aren't necessarily anatomically exact, and yet get the point across, and always bring in emotion. If it's a love scene, love scene, always bring in that emotional connection because when you think about sex as a couple, when you think about it as two people who love each other and you could be horny or whatever, but you're still reinforcing that bond, you're expressing your feelings for each other. Emotion's always a part of it. Mischief, the dog agrees. <laughs> but emotion is always um, a factor. And use that, use that to your advantage because it can be a beautiful thing, it can be a disgusting, disrespectful thing, it can be um, a confusing thing, and that's why I started off with saying decide on the purpose of the scene and what role it plays for each party involved. If you have two main characters and they're both the ones in the scene, you need to figure out what does this mean, okay, say it's heterosexual, what does it mean to him and what does it mean to her? Um, and really, you should be doing that for every scene. Every scene should break down into what do they want? What does this person want out of this scene? And what does that person want? And where is the conflict? Um, in sex scenes, there doesn't have to be conflict. Hopefully there isn't necessarily conflict. Sometimes there is a power play. And you know, in sex, there always is a little bit of a power play. So um, explore that. And the two more closing remarks I have. Number one, do not feel that just because you haven't had sex or haven't had a lot of sex or haven't had a certain type of sex, that that doesn't mean you can't write about it. Um, I think that once we get into that line of thinking, it really limits our imaginations. It really limits, you know, it's the same thing as, well, I've never been to that mountain range, so I guess I should just set my story downtown because I wanted to write about these people going in the mountains, but I've never been there, so, you know, like, do your research. I'm not going to suggest how you do that research, but do your research to make sure that um, it does feel authentic, and fantasy can play an important role in all of this. So, um, don't, don't, and that leads me to my second closing point. Do not write with your mother, or your grandmother, or your grandfather or father, reading over your shoulder. And I don't mean that literally, but with this type of scene, because there's so many in, you know, we're so inhibited and um, 
and were um, repressed, I guess is a better way to put it. Um, and we, there is that big cultural taboo still, even here in the U.S. of A. Whatever, we were founded by Puritans. But um, give yourself permission to go there. And like all scenes, you can go all out. And nobody's going to see it but you. So you can go all out and write this fantasy, you can write this long scene, you can write out every single detail. And then later, when you've had time and distance, you can come back and you can say, mm, don't really need that part, don't really need that part, that was weird when they did that or said this, and you can edit it. But as I always advocate, in your first go at a scene, or first few goes, mm -hmm. don't hold back. Um, see what's there, because sometimes you will tap into something in your subconscious mm -hmm. that is trying to get out, but that you've been repressing. Um, and you need to just give yourself that permission. Mm -hmm. And even if it is something that will eventually be read by mm -hmm. someone who you're worried may shame you, then um, you're going to have to do a little bit of self-work and get to a point where you like don't care. Um, as I mentioned in Ophelia, there are how many sex scenes are in Ophelia? At least three? Maybe only three. And of course that crossed my mind when I wrote that book. I gave it to all my friends. I read it aloud to my sister. My parents read it. My uncle read it. <laughs> And one of my friends decided to make a joke, said, I never knew you had such a dirty mind. I'm like, it's not a dirty mind. It's just, you know, writing something steamy. But that was a concern of mine, especially having a background as in young adult fiction and doing um, my PG show, Happy Hobbit, on YouTube. Um, I didn't want that younger audience to just jump into buying this book, not being forewarned. So I probably was a little heavy handed with like, it's not X-rated or anything at all. In fact, um, fellow authors who write like erotica are like, please, like, you're just child's play. But still, you know, as a responsible adult, I wanted a semi-adult. <laughs> that's a whole nother vlog. Adulting. Who wants it? Who needs it? Everyone. But never mind. So anyways, trying to be a responsible citizen, or whatever, influence, influencer, I didn't want, um, like, a little kid to read it and be like, so that's what happens! You didn't tell me, Mom! <laughs> and, yeah. Um, but that said, you don't need to have a warning on it, you don't have to have a rating on it, um, unless it is, in, in, you know, look up the genre, find out what genre it is that you're writing in, and kind of, you know, feel out what's okay and what's not okay in your genre. As I said, young adult, um, at the time that I wrote Darkling at least, um, sex wasn't really encouraged because we're writing it for younger teens, and, um, you know, you don't really want 12, 13, 14 year olds I don't know, I'm going down the Puritan path. I was about to say getting pregnant, but just because they're reading about a freaking sex scene in a book doesn't mean that they're going to go out and get pregnant. In fact, it probably means less because they're the kids who are reading and like vicariously experiencing it. And if you could give them a healthy relationship in a book, then they'll know what it looks like for real life. Tangent. Over. <sighs> Sorry, that was a moment of like self-reflection where I realized, you know, so here I am. That's good though. That's good. Because here I am giving you this advice, and you just witnessed me looking in a mirror going, yeah, but you don't want... Oh, wait a minute. Why do I have that thought in my head? Why do I have that belief? And again, it comes from this stuff being somewhat taboo, and um, how you're raised, and the influences around you. So, once again, my advice is determine the point of the scene, determine the tone, and use the language to inform the tone. And those will be your greatest tools going forward. That and let it all out. Because it's not good to keep that stuff repressed anyway. And if you need to just write something really saucy, even if it doesn't belong in a story, but you just kind of needed to get that tension out between the characters because you didn't want it to go that way, but some part of you needed to see that happen, go for it. Like all things, you know, I encourage writing it out and you can always edit later. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed this episode and if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, please leave them below. 
I would like to thank you very much for watching, especially for subscribing, and to my patrons who are amazing, wonderful, generous people, thank you so much for your support. If you are interested in joining their ranks and having fun, um, go ahead and pop over to my Patreon page where I've got lots of goodies available. And I suppose that's it. So you know where to find me on my social media and right here on YouTube. Drinking hot water. And I still have a short story available for free, The Walkers in Darkness. Um, I'll put the link to that below. All you do is enter your email and it, it's automated so it automatically sends you the, the short story. Pretty cool. This modern world, man. Goes back to the adulting thing. I could stand here talking for hours, but I won't. <laughs> so from me, and this piece of oak bark that I found on a hike that I thought was really pretty. Come on, get into focus. It's focusing on my creepy little hand in the background. Hello, camera. There, 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 kind of. Eh? Well, for me, and my chunk of oak bark that you can't really see, but I just take my word for it that it's pretty. I wish you a very fond farewell and happy love scene writing. <laughs>